This week's episode covers the transitional period between the early fighting of the American Revolution at Lexington and Concord and the first set-piece battle of the war, the Battle of Bunker Hill, so-called despite the fact that it was actually fought on nearby Breed's Hill. Indeed, this misnomer would suggest something of the confusion and uncertainty of affairs on both sides of the conflict during rapidly evolving circumstances. For the Americans, this confusion centered on a notable lack of organizational and administrative capability. Absent a unifying figure to unite them, New England's colonial militias would suffer from poor planning and a muddled chain of command. But if the British troops were far better supplied and led, their own sense of superiority would ultimately prove unfortunate, lowering their expectations regarding the enemy's commitment to the fight. As a result, the enmity and tenacity of their American counterparts came as a nasty shock. Which brings us to our present reading from Born in Battle, Part 2, They Would Not Flinch. Great Britain's American colonies had traveled a long road from their protest against the Stamp Act of 1765 to the shooting war begun on Lexington Green a decade later. It was a road of many twists and turns, to be sure, but by reasoned argument, by the conviction of self-interest, by propaganda and provocation, some critical mass of Americans had been persuaded that Great Britain was working a deliberate design against their constitutional liberty. To oversimplify a complex case, liberty was property, and hence taxation without real representation in Parliament was a species of theft. Moreover, Britain's thievery, many were coming to believe, violated a higher law than the British Constitution, the natural rights of man, an idea new to the 18th century that defined and made urgent the current political and economic debate. The terms of that debate were made even sharper by a social and cultural transformation difficult to quantify but nonetheless tangible. The growing consciousness of a distinct American national identity. Even so, in the decade before the outbreak of the Revolution, the opportunities for compromise and reconciliation had been many, and thoughtful men and women on both sides of the Atlantic could see that there was room in the British Empire for American liberty, with peace and prosperity the likely and happy consequence for both parties. Yet voices of moderation, British and American alike, had gone largely unheeded. In Great Britain, powerful and profoundly conservative forces, aided and abetted by venal, short-sighted politicians, carried the day in Parliament, and thus the coercive measures that body enacted served to provoke the very revolution they were intended to repress. As the crisis came to a head in America, the advocates of Whig liberty in the popular assemblies effectively deposed the royal governors and resolved to defend their cause by force of arms. Their cause was not, in the immediate aftermath of Lexington and Concord and for some time to come, American independence, but English liberty, constitutional liberty that Parliament had violated. Some American leaders were already referring to the British regulars they had fired on as the ministerial troops nicely, if falsely, distinguishing the king from the measures of his government. No one, at least publicly, was talking about overthrowing the king in the name of English liberty, though privately some might have argued that nothing was more English than revolution. In the days when English colonists were struggling for a foothold in the North American wilderness, Charles I had, after all, lost his throne along with his head in 1649 and in 1688 James II, refusing to learn his history lesson, was fortunate simply to lose his throne in the revolution Englishmen called glorious. Whether the redcoats now besieged in Boston were properly the king's or his minister's troops was a question for statesmen and philosophers to jaw about later. For the American militiamen, the question of what to do about them in the aftermath of Lexington and Concord was immediate and vexing. Just as immediate, and perhaps even more vexing, for the Americans 
was what to do with their own troops, those who had fought on Battle Road and the thousands more arriving daily from throughout New England. In this steadily gathering assembly was plenty of energy, to be sure, but precious little order, direction, and common purpose. Dr. Warren, now posted in Cambridge, wrote to the Provincial Congress that the Massachusetts men were busy as pissmires on a molehill, throwing up earthworks. And that effort was probably as good as any just now for the Provincial Congress was in the process of declaring its militia an army of observation. Having shot redcoats all the way from Concord to Boston, the militia was now directed to simply watch them while Congress organized and decided on a firmer course of action. Rhode Island to the south had sent men already and was now enlisting a new service, but its leadership was at least as uncertain as that of Massachusetts. Incongruously, these new enlistments would march, quote, in His Majesty's service for the preservation of the liberties of America, unquote. The cap plate on the bare hats of the British grenadiers who marched on Battle Road bore the initials G.R., George Rex. In the highly charged chaos after Lexington, one could only wonder how shooting the king's grenadiers might serve his royal purpose. And if, in the end, aggressive action against the British was what the New England colonies had in mind, this half-armed, ill-equipped, and motley mob now fronting Boston was not much of an instrument to wage war with. Joseph Warren, waiting for his own Major General's commission to be confirmed, admitted tactfully but candidly that the army was in such a shifting, fluctuating state as not to be capable of perfect regulation. It is difficult to say what numbers our army consists of. If a return could be had one day, it would by no means answer for the next. Warren might just as well have cited the words of Yankee Doodle. The men and boys were gathered as thick as hasty pudding. Indeed, loyalists, appalled by the events of April 19th, could take some heart from the mess their Whig neighbors appeared to be making of their rebellion. Loyalist poet Jonathan O'Dell characterized the situation as follows. Here anarchy before the gaping crowd proclaims the people's majesty aloud. Legions of senators infest the land, and mushroom generals thick as mushrooms stand. Even patriot Benjamin Thompson had to admit that the New England troops were an army only if that mass of confusion may be called an army. The confusion ran from the ranks up and from the high command down. Strictly speaking, despite what the four New England colonies had framed on paper for their militia organizations, there was no high command just yet. While militiamen came and went in front of Boston, delegates from all the colonies but Georgia were making their way to Philadelphia for the Second Continental Congress to commence on the 10th of May. This body would determine what the middle and southern colonies would or would not do to support their New England brethren, but for now it was exclusively a New England war. In the midst of this uncertainty, however, the Yankees were given an unintended gift by General Gage, and that gift was time. Though he had no clearer idea of actual American strength than Dr. Warren, Gage was sure that his force was considerably outnumbered. For the time being, he would withdraw his lonely outpost from Bunker Hill, fortify Boston Neck, and await reinforcement. And while Gage waited, mushroom generals were indeed springing up in the American camp. Yet regardless of Tory sneers, many of them turned out to be men of ability. Artemis Ward of Massachusetts, though older than his years at 47 and something of a prudent plotter, had seen service in the French and Indian War and was an able administrator. He was seconded by a doctor-turned-soldier, John Thomas, likewise a veteran of the last French War, who had earned a reputation as an aggressive fighter. In the long American arc running from Chelsea to Dorchester, Ward took immediate command of the Massachusetts men north of the Charles River and delegated the southern sector to Thomas. Though contemporary newspaper accounts spoke confidently that spring of a grand American army, 
In fact, the arrival of the New Hampshire, Connecticut, and Rhode Island contingents made four distinct commands. New Hampshire sent its provincial brigade, some 1,200 men, mostly veterans, led by tall, sinewy Colonel John Stark, an Indian fighter who frankly admired the native people he fought against. Taken prisoner by the Indians during the last French War, he had been adopted by the chief of the St. Francis tribe. Connecticut sent a full 6,000 men under capable Brigadier General Joseph Spencer. But the driving force in the Connecticut command was Israel Putnam. Broad, beefy, and belligerent, Old Putt was, among other things, a hard man to kill. With Rogers' Rangers, he had fought French and Indians on the frontier, where he had been tomahawked and very nearly burned at the stake. He had survived Abercrombie's bloody failure at Ticonderoga, and returned with Amherst to have a share in his victory. Shipwrecked in the Caribbean, he later led a regiment of rangers through musketry and cannon fire in the conquest of Havana, all this before settling down on a prosperous farm in Pomfret. And yet he was quick to answer the alarm of 19th of April. By contrast, the brigadier of Rhode Island's 1,500 men was a most unlikely soldier, Nathaniel Green, a tall, youthful, well-to-do Quaker. He had been read out of the meeting for his enlistment as a private in the Kentish Guards in 1774. He limped slightly on a gimpy knee and wheezed with asthma, and all he knew about soldiering came from books, not experience. But there was a quiet and determined confidence about him that men responded to. Still, when he reached the American lines around Boston, it was clear that it would take more than determined confidence to make something effective out of the American host. The want of government and of a certainty of supplies, he wrote, have thrown everything into disorder. So General Ward and the others went patiently to work imposing order as best they could, sorting out commands, organizing them into regiments, and entrenching and fortifying against a possible British attempt to break out of Boston. Fortunately for the Americans, the Redcoats continued to rest on their arms. In fact, the two most salient threats to the American cause at this point came from within the American camp. First, with four foreign armies gathered, there was no end to wrangling within the officer corps about rank and authority. Indeed, this struggle about rank would end only with the end of the war, at which point a new struggle broke out about reputation to be fought on the field of memoirs. Second, and even more disconcerting, the militiamen in the ranks did as citizen soldiers had always done. Believing that no real fighting was imminent, the men drifted back home to tend their shops, farms, and families. It was springtime, most were farmers, and sowing wheat and corn would not wait on the making of revolution. Others, accustomed to the free and easy democracy of the village militia, simply walked off, unwilling to serve under officers not of their own choosing. In exasperation, Ward told Congress that unless a more permanent army was enlisted, I shall be left all alone. The response of the Provincial Congress was ambitious enough, an act to enlist a volunteer army of 30,000 men from throughout the New England colonies, all of whom would serve to the year's end. In actuality, this eighth-month army would fall well short of 30,000. But by the middle of June, something like ten or 12,000 were more or less organized, though not properly armed, equipped, or supplied. Such details would have to wait until the Continental Congress did something more purposeful to support the war effort. The sticky problem of unified command in New England would be resolved for now by New Englanders, as New Hampshire officially put its army under Ward's command and Connecticut and Rhode Island instructed their troops to accept voluntarily Ward's direction. Lack of deliberate centralized control in a complex enterprise is of course generally a problem, but one of its consequences is sometimes an opportunity for individual initiative. In May, two remarkable Americans, Ethan Allen and Benedict Arnold, stepped forward to seize that initiative. Connecticut-born, Allen was a powerful, hard-drinking, profane lead miner now turned to farming on the New Hampshire grants. What is today the state of Vermont 
The grants were then much in dispute between New Hampshire and New York, and Allen and his band of Green Mountain Boys had played a violent part in that dispute, such that New York had gone so far as to put a price on Allen's head. Admittedly rough, but no primitive, he was something of a thinker, and had written, among other works, a deist tract entitled Reason the Only Oracle of Man. Benedict Arnold was a shorter, though sturdily built man, sprung from well-to-do Rhode Island merchants. Having prospered in New Haven, Connecticut, as by turns apothecary, bookseller, merchant, and horse trader, this zealous son of liberty was intelligent, energetic, and intensely ambitious. Though neither Arnold nor Allen was at first aware of the other, their common object was the seizure of Fort Ticonderoga on the southern end of Lake Champlain. Built by the French as Fort Carillon back in 1755, the fort had turned back one British attack in 58, only to fall the following year. By the time of the Revolution, succeeding winters and neglect had reduced the massive works to, in the words of a British engineer, an amazing useless mass of earth. It was garrisoned now by less than fifty officers and men of the twenty-six Cameronians, Scottish riflemen under the command of Captain William de Laplace. Some of these were disabled veterans of the last war, many were sick, and all seemed to have been fairly demoralized by guarding a pile of rubble in the waste of the dark northern forest. But Americans had excellent reason to covet this pile. Commanding Lake Champlain, the entrance to Lake George, and passage to the Hudson River to the west, it was the gateway of invasion from Canada into the heart of the northern colonies. Then, too, if disaffected Canadians made common cause with the Americans, a recurring American daydream, Canada's forces could move south across the lakes against the British overlords. Perhaps most important just now, however, Ticonderoga's ruins still bristled with cannon, especially heavy guns, that might be put to use in front of Boston. Accordingly, soon after Lexington, Arnold approached the Massachusetts Committee of Safety with a plan to mount an expedition against the fort where he himself had fought back in the French War. After some hemming and hawing, Massachusetts commissioned Arnold to raise 400 troops in western Massachusetts for that purpose. In the meantime, however, Allen had already been authorized by the Connecticut Assembly to take his Green Mountain Boys north with the same design. Arnold had in fact just reached Stockbridge in the Berkshire Mountains, and had hardly begun recruiting when he learned that Allen and the Green Mountain Boys were already in Castleton in the New Hampshire Grants, and about to jump off for Ticonderoga. Thus, if Arnold wished to take the fort, he would first have to overtake Allen. In fact, a third expedition against Fort Ty had jumped off ahead of them both. Colonel Samuel Parsons, a New Haven son of liberty, seeking authority from no one, raised a handful of men and some money and started north on his own hook. This little band was already with Allen in the neighborhood of Castleton when Arnold rode in with his Committee of Safety Commission and no troops. What diplomats call a free and frank exchange of views unfolded. Arnold insisted on the command. Allen stood by his own hard-headed resolve, his Connecticut commission, and, to the main point, his force of over two hundred men. In the end, a disgruntled Arnold, presumptive co-commander, pushed north with the rest. It was a strange enough expeditionary force. A gang of frontiersmen from the Hampshire Grants, acting on the authority of the extra-legal Connecticut Assembly, joined by Parsons' band of freebooters answering to no one, joined by a Connecticut man with a Massachusetts commission, all marching to seize a British fort in what New Yorkers, at any rate, were sure was still the colony of New York. And if this was not strange enough, what unfolded when it reached Hans Cove on the east shore of Champlain and a couple of miles north of the fort was almost comic. By the night of the ninth of May, they numbered somewhere short of three hundred men, but enough boats to transport them all to the opposite shore could not be found. Dawn was nearing when Allen decided to load the two boats on hand 
with less than a third of his total force. Across the lake they rode in the darkness, landing just above the fort, where they halted while Alan and Arnold had one more free and frank discussion about who actually commanded, a dispute resolved rather awkwardly by Alan's threat to make Arnold the very first prisoner of the campaign. Then, even more awkwardly, Alan and Arnold strode off side by side to attack the fort with some eighty men at their back. The gate to this erstwhile Gibraltar of the New World, meanwhile, was open, defended by a sleepy-headed sentry who raised a musket and called out a challenge. Alan thrust him aside with a blow of his sword. The Americans rushed in, and Alan and Arnold raced each other to the officers' quarters, where Alan shouted, "'Come out of there, you damned old rat!' And Ticonderoga's hapless second-in-command, Lieutenant Jocelyn Feltham, appeared in the doorway with nothing more warlike than a pair of breeches in his hand. When de Laplace, aroused from sleep by the commotion, appeared, Alan demanded the surrender of the fort. De Laplace, sufficiently embarrassed, still had the presence of mind to ask by whose authority this demand was made. In the name of the great Jehovah and the Continental Congress, Alan thundered, giving equal dignity, it would appear, to nature's God, and the delegates set to meet this very morning in Philadelphia. Or rather, this was the way Alan himself, not without literary flair, recalled the encounter in after time, though neither Feltham nor de Laplace nor Arnold remembered it quite the same way. In any case, whether the fort and its hundred cannon was now the rightful possession of Connecticut or Massachusetts or the Continental Congress or the great Jehovah, it was demonstrably no longer King George's. Pausing to relish their triumph, Ticonderoga's conquerors, in Allen's words, tossed about the flowing bowl and wished success to Congress and the liberty and freedom of America. Not content to rest on their laurels, two days later, a detachment under Seth Warren, Arnold among them but still not in command, moved north and invested the fortifications at Crown Point, which had been wrecked and abandoned by the British in the wake of Ticonderoga's fall. Shortly after, Skeensborough, at the head of the lake, fell to another detachment, putting in American hands a schooner belonging to the late squire of that place. This Arnold promptly appropriated, and with a force of his own at last he sailed north all the way to St. John's on the Richelieu River, and seized the fort and its garrison there, his energy and ambition finally rewarded with a conquest. Soon after, he returned to Crown Point, and with greater conquests in mind, began to gather a makeshift navy for operations on the lakes, which he considered an excellent staging area for a possible invasion of Canada. But cautious politicians now overtook the ambitious warrior. As far as Connecticut was concerned, Ticonderoga and Crown Point were properly its conquests, and after some wrangling, Massachusetts agreed. At this point, Arnold dismissed his troops and returned to Cambridge, the sweet savor of victory now turned to ashes in his mouth. Perhaps it was just as well. When the Second Continental Congress learned after the fact that British forts had been taken in their name, they were as much disconcerted as uplifted. Many still held out hopes for a reconciliation with Great Britain, hopes unlikely to be nourished by seizing its possessions. And despite the strategic importance of the northern posts, Congress, after sharp debate, agreed, at least for the moment, to abandon them. The cannon and other supplies, however, would go to the American camp until British possessions could be properly returned to their rightful owners. Officially, Congress still looked for the restoration of the former harmony between Great Britain and these colonies so ardently wished for by the latter. Meanwhile, despite success on Battle Road and conquest in the North Country, the people of America in Congress assembled were by no means united in purpose about this war that long smoldering dissent and a chance spark in Lexington Green had set ablaze. In fact, not even all the colonies were represented in Philadelphia, since Georgia in the Deep South had yet to send an official delegation. 
The mood of the people themselves up and down the colonies, however, was unquestionably warlike. A frenzy of revenge, Thomas Jefferson noted in a letter, seems to have seized all ranks of people in Virginia. It was a frenzy certainly incited by events in far-off Massachusetts Bay, but much inflamed by propaganda crafted by the artful pen of Sam Adams, a man of most serpentine cunning, in the words of one Tory. Sent out over Joseph Warren's signature, and carried south on lathered horses, Adams's account, as graphic as it was frankly false, described the barbarous murders committed on our innocent brethren at Lexington and Concord, and denounced the ministerial vengeance wreaked upon women, children, and old men. So effective was Adams' brutal tale that when it reached London, well ahead of Gage's own very understated report, outraged Britons protested violently against the government's American policy and vowed to aid their suffering American cousins. One delegate to the Congress, a tall Virginian named George Washington, though himself much distrustful of the passions of the common man, took to wearing his militia uniform to sessions of Congress. His mere appearance in Virginia's buff and blue spoke a great deal more than the colonel did himself about his will to resist. Even John Dickinson, an open enemy of those who privately argued for American independence, both hoped for and despaired of reconciliation. Not so long ago his calm and reasoned tract, titled Letters from a Farmer in Pennsylvania, had argued for constitutional liberty safely within the British Empire. Now, in the face of what he regarded as the butchery of unarmed Americans, he grimly wondered on what ground reconciliation might be achieved. Still, as summer neared, Congress continued to talk about the possibility of peace with Great Britain, always mindful of France and Spain. Waiting in the wings of the drama, neither of these foreign powers had abandoned its ideas about imperial dominion in America. But Congress would not be the first or last deliberative body to talk peace while preparing for war. On June 14th, they voted to raise ten rifle companies from Virginia, Maryland, and Pennsylvania. It was an exceedingly modest beginning to what would become the Continental Army. But whatever these companies would or would not become in the shadowy future, they were of no value whatsoever just now in shaping events in Massachusetts. There, four New England armies, in various states of organization and tenuously under the direction of General Artemis Ward, still squared off against Thomas Gage's regulars unhappily besieged in Boston. In this stalemate, an uneasy truce held sway. A gentleman's agreement between Dr. Warren and General Gage allowed Loyalist refugees from the countryside into the city and Whig refugees out. As for the regulars, they were in no immediate danger of being overwhelmed by the Army of Observation opposite, nor were they in danger of being starved out so long as the British Navy was at hand. But they were understandably dispirited. Bloodied and driven into Boston by an armed rabble, they were badly fed, wretchedly housed, and vulnerable to diseases, in particular smallpox, which was far more deadly than musketry. Perhaps most galling to their spirit was the fact that they remained mostly idle and unable to come to grips with the cause of their suffering. Such fighting as had taken place since the fateful 19th of April had been a series of very minor encounters in May. On Noodles Island and Hog Island, north and east of Boston, rebels and redcoats skirmished over the livestock grazing there. In these marshy tussles, the British shed some fresh blood without much fresh meat to show for it. They lost into the bargain the schooner Diana, burnt to the waterline when hard-driving Israel Putnam waded out with a gang of militiamen and boarded her himself. As General Gage admitted in a letter to Lord North, dated 12 June, the situation these wretches have taken in forming the blockade of this town is judicious and strong, being well entrenched where the situation requires it, and with cannon. Across the Atlantic, the enemies of Britain's American policy made volatile protests as soon as the news that Boston was besieged reached them. 
In Parliament, William Pitt, powerful and eloquent Whig champion, gave a highly partisan spin to Gage's very real military predicament. The British garrison, he fumed, was an impotent general in a dishonored army, trusting solely to the pickaxe and the spade for security against the just indignation of an injured and insulted people. Elsewhere in London, another wit tossed off this satiric squib at Gage's expense. The saints, alas, have waxen strong. In vain your fasts and godly song, to quell the rebel rout. Within his line skulks valiant Gage. Like Yorick starling in a cage, he cries, I can't get out. In truth, the ministry had been brooding for quite some time about the capacity of their mild general in America to quell the rebel rout. Gage had been calling for reinforcement for at least a year, though not in the numbers he hoped for, troops had been dispatched from Halifax and Ireland even before the fighting at Lexington and Concord had made his need of them most urgent. They would eventually bring his strength up to something like 10,000 regulars, but in their numbers were three more than Gage had expressly asked for, William Howe, Henry Clinton, and John Burgoyne, Major Generals all. It was impossible for Gage or anyone else to misunderstand their presence. The ministry was sending them to America to light a fire under Thomas Gage. Thus, on a misty morning on the 25th of May, Howe, Clinton, and Burgoyne sailed into Boston Harbor aboard the Cerebus, fittingly named, it would now appear, for the three-headed dog in classical mythology who guarded the gates of hell. As far as Burgoyne was concerned, it was the auspicious arrival of a triumvirate of reputation. Considerably less impressed was a London wag who wrote, Behold the Cerebus, the Atlantic plow, her precious cargo, Burgoyne, Clinton, Howe, bow, wow, wow. The Cerebus sailed two days after Lexington had blown a political crisis up into a shooting war, and none of the three generals aboard her really knew what lay ahead. When a British sloop, the Otter, sailed near in the harbor, Burgoyne himself hailed her for news and heard for the first time of the bloody business on Battle Road and that 10,000 colonials held Gage's command at bay in Boston. It was astonishing news, but nothing to shake Burgoyne's buoyant confidence. What? Ten thousand peasants keep five thousand king's troops shut up? Burgoyne huffed. Well, let us get in, and we'll soon find elbow room. This spontaneous witticism Burgoyne would have opportunity to repent at leisure, for the derisive epithet General Elbow Room would follow him all through his service in America. Finally, returning to Boston as a prisoner after his disaster at Saratoga in 1777, Burgoyne was saluted by the shrill voice of an old woman in the crowd that milled near Charlestown Ferry. Make way! Make way! The general is coming! Give him elbow room! But as the fog lifted this May morning in 75, there was no reason for the British to think that fresh troops and three of the nation's best and brightest general officers would not make short work of this American uprising. Though 53 years old, Burgoyne was the most junior of the three major generals. A fine portrait by Sir Joshua Reynolds shows him as he no doubt liked to see himself, a romantically handsome figure dominating the canvas with storm clouds roiling over his head and a sturdy line of battle in the background. His combat experience was creditable, if limited. He fought in Portugal in the last French war and was much praised and petted for seizing Valencia at the head of a force of dragoons known as Burgoyne's Light Horse. In peace, a fortunate marriage had given him the wherewithal to relish London's high life. Like many of his fellow aristocrats, he had a particular passion for gaming tables and marriage notwithstanding the company of beautiful women. He also fancied himself a playwright of some repute, and in fact David Garrick, had made a tidy little success of one of his plays, Made of the Oaks. His nickname, Gentleman Johnny, however, came not from the drawing rooms, but from his humane and daring conception that British enlisted men were in fact men, 
and not to be trained and disciplined like spaniels with a stick. Men and officers alike were happy to serve under him. Burgoyne's own commitment to this American service, however, was hard to gauge exactly. Publicly, he was a passionate supporter in Parliament of the ministry's get-tough American policy. As the trouble overseas reached a crisis, he had asked rather fulsomely, Is there a man in England who does not think the parliamentary rights of Great Britain a cause to fight for, to bleed and die for? Privately, however, Gentleman Johnny the Gambler was hedging his bets against the odds of his own ambition. Even if Thomas Gage were to be recalled, he, Burgoyne, would remain third of three in Boston, and seeing little chance for glory there, he asked to be posted to command in New York. When his maneuvering for that post came to nothing, he wrangled, through Lord North, permission from George the Third to return to England if no important independent command came his way. It must have seemed to insiders, at any rate, a sign of less than complete devotion to the cause of Britain's parliamentary rights in America. Sir Henry Clinton was, as it happened, American-born. The accident of his birth in 1738, however, had not visibly nourished in the man any special sympathy for Americans. Though long after the Revolution he would insist that he was not a volunteer in that war. The only son of a British admiral, he had been soldiering since he bought a lieutenant's commission in the Second Foot Guards at thirteen. He campaigned on the continent in the Seven Years' War, without particular distinction, but had risen nonetheless to the rank of Major General by his thirty-fourth year. Next to the ruddy and expansive Burgoyne, Clinton seemed bland, a short, secretive, round-faced man soft with middle age. Not without a measure of self-awareness, Clinton characterized himself in canine terms as a shy bitch. His fellow officers found him intelligent and capable, a soldier of promise despite a deep-grained habit of resenting superiors and mistrusting comrades. The combination of searching suspicion of his brother officers and self-doubt under responsibility would later lead him to grief, but he was a trained professional of long experience. On the face of things, he must have seen more than a match for the mushroom generals springing up in New England. Senior to both Burgoyne and Clinton, Sir William Howe was by anyone's measure the ablest and most battle-tested of the three. While his combat record was first-rate, his politics were at best problematic. As a lieutenant colonel commanding a well-drilled regiment, he played an active part in Britain's victories at Louisbourg, Belle Isle, and Havana. His finest hour had come on a dark September night in 1759, when General James Wolfe had called on him to lead the detachment that crossed the St. Lawrence and scaled the heights of Abraham at Quebec. In the fighting that followed, he had torn off his coat and stood his part on the firing line, helping to beat off a determined French attack. Wolfe himself believed the king had no finer soldier than Billy Howe in his service. He was a big, darkly handsome man, and still a powerful presence despite an equally powerful appetite for long nights of wine, women, and games of chance. He had intelligence and energy, no doubt and was in his way a child of fortune, thought to be an illegitimate grandson of the first King George, and certainly accepted by the present George as a cousin. Howe had a special connection to America by way of his eldest brother, George Augustus, who had been killed in Abercrombie's failure against the French at Fort Ticonderoga. So devoted were the Yankee militiamen who served with George Howe, that they later raised a monument to him in Westminster Abbey, testifying to the affection their officers and soldiers bore to his command. It may be, as one student of the Revolution has suggested, that King George sent Howe to America at least in part because he hoped that Americans' old affection for the Howe name might serve to bring about a reconciliation before matters there were completely out of hand. If so, the King, never an astute politician, was turning a blind eye to Howe's firmly Whig sympathies. He stood for Parliament from Nottingham in 74, 
assuring his constituents that he would neither support an aggressive policy toward the colonies nor accept a command there. When the king's appointment came, however, Howe was compelled to answer the understandable indignation of the voters. He could not refuse, he explained with awkward sincerity, without incurring the odious name of backwardness to serve my country in time of distress. Knowing Whigs in Parliament, however, nodded slyly at one another when they heard the news. In the event of further hostilities, Billy Howe, they believed, would do the Americans no harm. When Howe, Burgoyne, and Clinton settled into Boston and reviewed the situation with Gage, they were obliged to agree that, jesting aside, the British urgently needed elbow room of some kind. By the first part of June, a reorganized colonial army ringed the Boston Peninsula roughly thus. The right wing under John Thomas was posted at Roxbury and fronted with field guns both narrow Boston Neck and the Dorchester Peninsula on the extreme right. The center under Artemis Ward at Cambridge stretched from the Charles River north to Prospect Hill and was supported by three forts and such guns as the colonials could bring to bear. The left wing was the responsibility of New Hampshire, John Stark's regiment across the Mystic at Medford, and nearer to hand James Reed's, hugging Charlestown just below the point where the roads from Cambridge and Medford joined and crossed the vulnerable neck. In his Cambridge headquarters, General Ward's sense of the real troop strength holding these lines was not a great deal clearer than General Gage's, since one day's report never agreed with the next. But he must have had something like 15,000, roughly half of these eight months men, immediately under arms. The rest militia in the countryside prepared to hustle to the front in the face of an emergency. When and if such an emergency would arise was not clear to anyone, and Artemis Ward's inertia thus far was a particular source of dismay to the colonial citizen soldiers. Restless under military discipline, they had by their lights signed on to fight redcoats, not to dig everlasting ditches across the water from the British lion at bay. Of course, Gage's inertia was at least equally dismaying to both his own command and loyalist New England. Nor was the triumvirate of reputation slow to write home to report that Gage was, also in Burgoyne's words, unequal to his present situation. Only a genius of the very first class Burgoyne added, would be equal to so grave a responsibility. If the powers across the sea, he did not need to add, believed him to be that first-class genius so much the better for the honor of Great Britain, and of course for John Burgoyne. Nor was Gentleman Johnny quite done puffing. In June he prevailed on Gage to issue a proclamation. Published on the 12th, it declared martial law in Boston more or less irrelevant in a city already in the grip of two armies, and offered pardons to all offending rebels except Sam Adams and John Hancock, which might have meant something to the rebels if they were of a mind to be pardoned, which they were not. In sum, the proclamation was John Burgoyne's wind sent forth in Thomas Gage's name. It mocked the infatuated multitudes of rebellious Yankees who, with a preposterous parade of military arrangement, affected to hold the army besieged. In fact, the siege was, at least for the moment, not at all preposterous. When the text reached London, Whigs were quick to see Burgoyne's hand in it and roundly jeered. As one spat, They affect to hold the army besieged? They do not affect it. They actually do besiege ye in spite of your teeth. And the next time you write to your friends, say in plain English that the Americans effected the siege. It was a little lesson on the verbs affect and effect, worthy of Dr. Johnson. But more than semantics were at issue here. Failing to intimidate the Americans or hearten the regulars and loyalists, the proclamation pushed the British inevitably toward decisive action. It didn't take three major generals and a windy speech to convince Gage that he was unlikely to restore royal governance in the province by outcamping the enemy. <laughs>
nor did it take a military genius to see that the key to breaking out of, or for that matter into, Boston, was control of the high ground surrounding the citadel in the bay. On Dorchester to the south were Nook's Hill on the peninsula's western point and two knobby hills known as Dorchester Heights. To the north on Charlestown Peninsula were Bunker Hill at the neck and a lesser height, Breed's Hill, nearest Boston's north end. Heavy guns and rebel hands posted on Dorchester or Charlestown or both would make Boston a very hot place for the British to hold. Fortunately for them, Ward did not have those guns, and even if he had them, he lacked the powder to sustain a bombardment that might drive the redcoats out. British guns on the same ground would, of course, be an effective first step in prying loose the rebels' hold on the city. To that end, Gage called his generals to a council of war, and in short order they agreed to a plan of action. The first strike would move south against Dorchester, seize the heights, and establish two redoubts to control the causeway. With the neck secure, regulars would drive the rebels from Roxbury at the point of the bayonet, breaking the American right there and threatening their center at Cambridge. This accomplished, the British would then turn north to Charlestown, seize and hold Bunker Hill, and force the neck. From that point, they could either outfight or outflank the rebels from Cambridge. I suppose the rebels will move from Cambridge, General Howe wrote confidently to his brother, Admiral Richard Howe and that we shall take and keep possession of it. The Dorchester attack was set for 18 June. In the end, however, the British were beaten to the punch, forced to make their move not into Dorchester, but into Charlestown, and not on their own terms, but on the Americans. In part, events were shaped by two accidents of military intelligence. First, Britain's chief spy in the American camp, Dr. Benjamin Church, had been sent by Massachusetts Committee of Safety off to Philadelphia with dispatches for the Continental Congress, closing for the time being Thomas Gage's window on American plans. Church's long betrayal of the cause he professed would not be discovered until the end of September. Second, word of Gage's own plan had reached the American camp by way of a New Hampshire man, unknown to history, but held by the committee to be a gentleman of undoubted veracity. He had got wind of the British move in Boston, possibly at John Burgoyne's own table, reported it to the New Hampshire Committee of Safety, who in turn reported same to the Massachusetts Committee of Safety. On June the 15th, that body met initially to consider its response to the late extraordinary proclamation of General Gage. It is well to remember that real possibilities for peace remained if men of vision and flexibility had thought to seize them. But awareness of Gage's plans for an attack on 18 June, just three days off, spurred the committee to action. By unanimous resolution, it recommended to the Council of War in Cambridge that Bunker's Hill in Charlestown be securely kept and defended, and also some one hill or hills on Dorchester Neck be likewise secured. This resolution thrust the responsibility once more on Artemis Ward. He was in some a capable and careful administrator, but with no staff to speak of and no reliable chain of command, he was nearly overwhelmed by the business of raising and maintaining an army at all, let alone risking it in battle. Like Gage, he huddled with his generals. Brigadier Israel Putnam, whose aggressive energy in the field was never questioned, though his judgment in council often was, who urged an immediate move on both Dorchester Heights and Bunker Hill in Charlestown. The proposal to seize the high ground in Dorchester went nowhere. John Thomas in Roxbury said frankly that he was ill-prepared to take aggressive action from that quarter. But perhaps to Ward's surprise, perhaps even to his dismay, the proposal to fortify and hold Bunker Hill was supported by three men of cool-headed judgment, Colonel William Prescott, thoughtful and well-born commander of a Massachusetts regiment, had served with such an unflappable skill at Louisbourg that he had been offered and had refused a commission in a British regiment. Seth Pomeroy of Connecticut was likewise a respected veteran of the French wars, though nearing seventy he had plenty of fight left in him, as he would soon show. And Dr. Warren, 
the aristocrat with the common touch had already shown on Battle Road both a capacity for leadership and a combative spirit. Thus, on Friday, 16 June, it was decided. Colonel Prescott would lead a detachment out of Cambridge to seize and fortify Bunker Hill that very night. Three Massachusetts regiments, Prescott's own plus James Fry's and Ebenezer Bridges, a little more than a thousand men in all, would be at the heart of the strike force. These would be strengthened by 200 Connecticut men under Captain Thomas Knowlton and a small company of New Hampshire men. The redoubt itself was to be built under the direction of an aging but highly capable chief engineer and artilleryman, Colonel Richard Gridley, a man who had once hauled cannon for General Wolfe up the sheer face of the Heights of Abraham. He was seconded by his elder son, Major Scarborough Gridley, who would lead his father's artillery battalion. In all this, Ward was improvising, and improvising against his own better judgment. It was a pitifully small force to send into Charlestown, half-equipped and badly armed, but at the same time he was unwilling to risk more. Nor did the plan provide for reinforcement should the foray blow up into a pitched battle, or for retreat should the force be overwhelmed. As for Dr. Warren, if he had reservations about the plan, they would go to the grave with him on the morrow. By nine o'clock on 16 June, Prescott's column was assembled in Cambridge, and pausing for a dram of rum and a benediction, stepped out for Charlestown in the sultry darkness. That the column was in fact headed for Charlestown, only Prescott knew. All the men in the ranks really knew was what the receipt of rum and prayer could tell them, that they must be marching into harm's way. It was not, in truth, a very imposing military spectacle. They were dressed in farmers' homespun, as one witness remembered, in colors as various as the barks of oak, sumac, and other trees of our hills and swamps could make them. As for arms, the men carried equally various relics of every weight and caliber. Seth Pomeroy, for example, shouldered the musket he had made himself and carried at Louisbourg thirty years before. If the arms were old, though, the men were green. Some veterans there were among them, but many a fresh-fledged junior officer carried a sword very recently hammered out by the village smithy, tempered but untried. More important, very few possessed a bayonet, very much the business end of 18th century warfare. When Prescott reached Charlestown Neck, he met Israel Putnam, waiting with wagons carrying the gear to be used in fortifying Bunker Hill. Along with picks and shovels, the wagons carried gabions, wicker baskets to be filled with dirt, and fascines, bundles of brushwood to strengthen earthworks. Plenty of food, water, powder, and ball should have been in those wagons as well, but no one at Ward's headquarters had made arrangements for these most basic of provisions. The column stepped off once more and crossed the neck onto the peninsula. If any of the men in the ranks were inclined to consider omens at this point, a grim sight a quarter mile ahead was well worth considering. There, on a decrepit gallows, hung in chains, the mummified body of a black man named Mark, convicted of murdering his master in September of 1755. Hard by, his accomplice, Phyllis, had been burned at the stake. Those now marching in the cause of liberty were passing a gruesome memento mori, the terrible end of two slaves who rose against their master in the time of George the Second. Prescott, of course, had no time for brooding over the ghosts of another generation. He sent a company straight away into Charlestown, now all but deserted, to keep a sharp eye on the British across the water and hiked on himself to Bunker Hill. Here the British engineer Montresor had dug his redan back in April when the conquered column had come limping home, and here Prescott's orders called on him to dig in. But instead of going immediately to work with the spade, Prescott paused to confer with Gridley, his engineer, and Putnam, his second-in-command. Little is known with certainty about this council, 
but it must have focused on the terrain of the peninsula. Six months later, Montresor returned to make a survey of Charlestown, showing in fine detail what the three Americans could see in outline, even in the dark. This peninsula between the Mystic and the Charles was a rough triangle, a mile long and nowhere more than a half a mile wide, its apex at the neck and its base closest to Boston. In addition to the narrow neck, sometimes under water at high tide, its key features were three hills, Bunker Hill at 110 feet, nearest to the neck and hugging the mystic side, Breed's Hill in the middle at 75 feet, and Morton's Hill, a 35-foot knob at the southeast corner. From the comfortable distance of more than two centuries, and not in the hot haste of that June night, it is easy to say that the logical place to fortify was precisely where Prescott stood. American cannon here would front approaches from both rivers and the mainland. And British guns, both naval and those posted on Copps Hill in Boston, would have a hard time reaching the position effectively. Perhaps the three Americans believed that Bunker Hill on which they stood was actually Breed's Hill, or it may be that combative Old Put, knowing very well which was which, urged Prescott to dig in on Breed's Hill for no other reason than it was 600 yards closer to the enemy. In any case, Prescott gave the order. A small detachment would remain on Bunker Hill, but the main body would go on to Breed's Hill, so named for the farmer who grazed his cattle there in more peaceful times. The battle that was about to blow up there, however, would forever bear the name of Bunker Hill, which Prescott's men left behind them in the dark.